It is good to be with you again tonight. I hope you're all doing well. If you have any updates to our prayer concerns, anything we need to be praying about, any way that we can serve you as a congregation, I hope you will get in touch. I know we'll have the contact information on the screen in just a little bit if everything works out, but if you do not have access to the live stream, if you're listening by the phone tonight or cannot see that for some reason, my number is 608-224-0274. We would love to hear from you if there's anything that we could do to help you. Uh, please remember also that we are continuing to meet for worship every Lord's Day morning now at 9 o'clock in the morning. And so please be sure to sign up online. We have a limit of 25 people in the building uh, for that service. If that service fills up, we are also replaying the 9 o'clock service at 10.30 a.m. at the church building using the projector. So it won't be live, but we will be replaying that. And so if you need any help signing up, if you have any questions about the schedule, please contact either me or Kenna to get help with the Sign Up Genius. If you're listening by phone, and again, if you need any help with this, if there's anything we need to be praying about, if there's some way that we can serve you, I hope that you will give me a call. Again, 608-224-0274. We'd love to hear from you. I'm back out here in the garage again. It is chilly out here. I have not been able to see my breath yet tonight. And so, so far, so good. It is cool out here. You can see we're working through the wood pile in the garage a little bit more. Last week, I think it was about shoulder level. Uh, now that's down just a little bit further. I can almost lean back on it here a little bit. But we are burning through the wood, keeping our family warm this winter. And that is the intention of it. And so I, I appreciate uh, the good comments about, uh, about the winter and us staying warm this year. All right, tonight we get back to our study of the book of Luke. And by way of review, in case you might be joining us for the first time, we know that Luke is a Gentile. He is a medical doctor. He writes both the book of Luke and Acts to a man by the name of Theophilus. He makes a point of writing in chronological order. He also includes a number of people groups who were often overlooked in the, in the ancient world, women, widows, Gentiles, Samaritans, uh, the sick and the poor, and so on. And another thing with Luke being a medical doctor, there, there are some words scattered through Luke, some terminology that he uses that doctors would have used in the ancient world. And, and so Luke picks up on some things that some other people wouldn't pick up on. And I don't mention it when we get to it later. I probably forget to. But I'll mention it now. I noticed earlier today as I was reading through there that uh, when uh, Peter chops off the ear of the servant of the high priest, Luke notes which ear it is. It is his right ear. And so that seems interesting to me as he's interviewing witnesses later. Um, oh, he chopped the guy's ear off. Which ear was it? And so <laughs> he's looking for details like that. It's like he's writing up a report uh, about his work as a doctor. But anyway, Luke is a well-researched account. And once again, the Harmony of the Gospels will be very helpful this evening. In case you're interested, it's available on Amazon for around 25 bucks. It's basically just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John arranged in parallel fashion and in columns side by side. And it is especially helpful in this last week of the Lord's life that we're on. And so there's a chart near the end. Feel free to look at that. It's very helpful where the authors list the events of the last week along with the section numbers, and I hope that you'll pay some attention to that over there on page 349 if you have that. Uh, last week, we spent all of our time together looking at what happens on the Thursday evening before the crucifixion. So we are now at the very end of what we would commonly refer to as the Last Supper. Judas has already left the room to go make arrangements to betray the Lord. We've got the apostles arguing yet again about which one of them is the greatest. We have Jesus telling the remaining apostles that they will no longer be able to rely on the generosity of strangers as he told them to do previously. And so things are about to get rough. Things are about to get complicated. They're gonna be a bit more on their own than they were before. And so they'll need to bring along a money belt and a staff and a sword, unlike what he told them a few years earlier. And so they look around, they find two swords among them. Uh, apparently, at least a couple apostles are, are packing. And so uh, Jesus says, it is enough. So that's enough, that'll do the job. And then Jesus establishes the Lord's Supper. At this point in chronological order, we insert John chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17. And chapter 14, that's where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me, just to put that in context. And then in chapters 15 and 16, we have a number of references to Jesus ascending the Holy Spirit after he leaves this earth. And so he will send the Comforter. The Holy Spirit is described as the Comforter. 
and the Spirit will tell you what you need to say. The Spirit will give you the words that you need to speak. And we noted just briefly last week that this is directed to the apostles, not to all of God's people, but this is to the 11 apostles in particular. And of course, we know that the Spirit did communicate directly on a word-for-word basis to these men. And of course, uh, some of them went on to write books of the Bible. And that's how the Spirit communicates to us today. He communicated through the apostles who then wrote those things down and pass them along to us in written form, a reference to inspiration. And then we have the real Lord's Prayer, not the sample prayer from the Sermon on the Mount, but the real Lord's Prayer, the prayer we know Jesus actually prayed, which is in John chapter 17. And we didn't read it last week. We're not studying John, but we're just noting that in chronological order, that would get inserted right here uh, in this gap where we left off. So all of this brings us to where we pick up tonight as the apostles are getting ready to leave the upper room. So they're about to leave the upper room and and head out. And that brings us to Luke 22, verses 39 through 46. So tonight we start with Luke 22, 39 through 46. And he came out and proceeded, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples also followed him. When he arrived at the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him, and being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. When he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping from sorrow and said to them, Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not enter into temptation. In the parallel accounts, Matthew and Mark both tell us that they leave the upper room after singing a hymn. And I always find that interesting, especially the last eight months or so. That has been our, our new format, hasn't it? We study the word of God, we partake the Lord's Supper, we sing, and then we head out. And that's pretty much what the... Lord and his apostles do here. Uh, Luke points out that when they leave the upper room, they proceed, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. If you remember, over this last week of his life, we've noticed that Jesus would spend the days teaching in the temple, and then he would head out of the city at night over to the Mount of Olives to basically camp out there for the evening, and then it would start over. The next morning, he would go back into the city, teach all day, and that would repeat itself. And so John tells us that they cross over the ravine of the Kidron, and there is a garden there. Of course, we know this as the Garden of Gethsemane. In Matthew and Mark, right after Luke 22, 40, we have Jesus remind the apostles of a prophecy from Zechariah, where the prophet has God saying, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. And he then says, but after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. And when Jesus says these things about the sheep being scattered after the the shepherd being struck down, uh, Peter says, even though all may fall away, yet I will not. And so he makes that solemn promise, I will never fall away. And I, I think I've mentioned before that I've only heard two people in my life ever say, that they would never fall away. It's just kind of strange how it's come up, but in Bible discussions, one-on-one with people, I've had two people say, Baxter, I will never fall away. And what's interesting and very sad to me is both of those two men did, in fact, fall away. Isn't that strange? Um, But one of them, thankfully, has since returned and is now very faithful to the Lord. But I, I do find that interesting. So I think it's very dangerous for us to promise and say to others, maybe in a bragging way, I will never fall away. That's a dangerous thing to do. Remember, pride goes before destruction, according to the good book in the Old Testament. And so we need to be very cautious. I think we can be confident. We have no intention of falling away. We Nobody nobody can force us to fall away. Nobody will snatch us out of the Lord's hand. Uh, And yet we are uh, aware of reality. We are human beings, and we are weak sometimes. And so Uh, We don't have the intention to fall away, but we just need to be aware that it is always a possibility. In Matthew and Mark, uh, Jesus reminds Peter that before the cock crows, Peter will deny the Lord three times. Uh, But Peter, though, disagrees again, even though if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And, And all of the other disciples promise, and they say the exact same thing. 
They then come to the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew and Mark. Jesus tells the disciples to uh, go over there while I go a little bit deeper into the garden to pray. Uh, he takes Peter, James, and John with him deeper into the garden. Uh, Matthew and Mark both say that Jesus began to be very distressed and grieved and troubled. In Luke, uh, he just tells us that his disciples are supposed to pray. So he just says, pray so that you won't enter into temptation. So we have less detail in Luke than we have in Matthew and Mark. Uh, back in Luke, verse uh, in verse 41, Jesus now uh, goes off completely by himself. So now he leaves even Peter, James, and John. He goes about a stone's throw away, and he kneels down. And I would just mention here that sometimes it's good to kneel to pray. We have several postures for prayer in the Bible, we might say. We have kneeling, we have uh, standing, we have hands raised up in the air to heaven as if receiving a gift from God. We have people in the Bible laying face down on the ground before the Lord in prayer. And here we have Jesus kneeling. Uh, Matthew and Mark tell us that Jesus also falls down with his face to the ground to pray. And so it's an all-night event, and uh, he, he switches it up a few times. He moves around and, and has different postures in prayer. But back in Luke twenty two forty two, we have a record of what he's saying. Uh, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Obviously, I think he's referring to the crucifixion. He's referring to what's going to happen within the next 24 hours. Um, he's referring to everything that he's about to suffer, the physical part of it, the mental anguish of it, um, being offered up as a sacrifice, the, the physical and the mental, I would just emphasize here. He's willing, but he's looking for some other way out of, as I understand it. He, he's looking for some other option. Uh, I'm thinking maybe he was hoping for some scenario as w happened with Abraham. Remember when Abraham was told to offer Isaac on the altar right at the last moment with his hand raised the knife in his hand there it is there's the angel there's the ram and the bushes and, and all of that so maybe Jesus is hoping for some other way at the last moment for this to be different from what he assumes that it will be but ultimately though Jesus is willing he's just conflicted and so he's God but he's God in the flesh he's God and man at the same time in verse 43, we're told that an angel comes and ministers to him. This is something that we only find in Luke. I believe Matthew and Mark might tell us that angels came and ministered to him uh, at the time of his temptation in the wilderness, back uh, about three and a half years before this, when he went out to pray and fast in the wilderness. But here, this is something we only have in Luke, the angel coming to the garden. And then also in agony, we find here that his sweat becomes like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. Uh, this is also only found in Luke. Uh, doctors describe this condition as hematidrosis. That's a condition where uh, blood vessels supplying the sweat glands can sometimes burst under extreme distress. It's been known to happen to people facing execution, the extreme distress of seeing that coming and of course that's what's going on here uh, it has been known to happen to people going into battle and so soldiers preparing for what they know will be a very difficult and terrible thing uh, this has happened sweat glands the uh, the uh, capillaries bursting there and then that blood coming out at, appearing to be a bloody sweat with no real injury actually being visible uh, it's been known to happen to people facing uh, other extreme situations like that. It usually happens around the face. It usually stops on its own, um, but it can lead to further fatigue. It can lead to dehydration if it goes on long enough. So feel free to look up hematidrosis online. There are a number of good articles out there. There's a good WebMD article on it, along with a number of others. But it, it, it's interesting to me that Luke is the one who picks up on this. Luke is the one who mentions this as a medical doctor. Uh, he's the only gospel writer who picks up on it. And I can just imagine Luke interviewing Peter years later and maybe James and John and asking for more information. You know, where was the blood coming from? What did it look like exactly? What was going on here? How long did it last? And, and so on. And so Luke includes this tiny bit of information here that the others do not. Luke basically ends it in verses 45 and 46 with Jesus getting up and finding the disciples asleep and then leaving, encouraging them to pray so that they wouldn't be tempted. Between Matthew and Mark, though, we have more information here that we don't have in Luke. We find Jesus comes back to Peter, James, and John a total of three times. We don't have that here, but we just have a brief summary. So 
Uh, he actually goes back to them three times. Each time he kind of gets on them for falling asleep. I asked you to keep watch with me. Why can't you stay awake? That kind of thing. And uh, this is where Jesus says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I think most of us have heard that phrase, that little line in our culture. At least we used to uh, before we became something of a post-Christian society. I think that was a the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's something that I've heard in my life before. I haven't heard it for a long, long time. I'm doubting too many people outside the Lord's church, probably not too many in the Lord's church, could tell us where that phrase comes from. Uh, but this is the source of that phrase. Uh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So it comes from Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane as he gets on his disciples for falling asleep. Uh, the spirit was willing, meaning they wanted to stay awake. And yet they were flesh, and so they were tired, and they couldn't fight it off any longer. They were limited by their own humanity, and they fall asleep. Uh, Matthew and Mark both in this section with Jesus saying, Arise, let us be going. Uh, behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. In other words, let's do this. He was ready. So he goes into this uh, somewhat, I wouldn't say fearful, but he doesn't want to do it. He knows he needs to do it. He's looking for some other way. But once he spends the whole night in prayer, once that angel comes and ministers to him, he is now ready to press forward. And I would just emphasize here that he does this for all of us. He does this willingly. And I, I know not all the time do we think about that. All right, let's move on to the next paragraph then. And that is Luke 22, verses 47 through 53. So Luke 22, 47 through 53. While he was still speaking, behold, a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was preceding them, and he approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When those who were around him saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, Stop, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come against him, Have you come out with swords and clubs as you would against a robber? While I was with you daily in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this hour and the power of darkness are yours. And so here, as the Lord is still talking, as he's still speaking, um, Judas shows up here in this account. In John's account, we find that Judas comes to this place because he knows that Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Remember, Judas was one of them. This is where Jesus hangs out. This is where he goes to pray and to recharge and rejuvenate and teach privately. And remember, as we studied last week, the religious leaders are trying to avoid a confrontation in public. They are cowards. They are scared of the crowds. They want to make this thing go away quietly. And Judas has the perfect solution. He will guide them to where Jesus spends the night. Let's go get him while he's sleeping kind of thing uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Well, we find that Judas arrives with a multitude. In Mark, we find that this multitude is armed with swords and clubs. Uh, Matthew and Mark tell us that these people are coming from the chief priest and from the elders of the people. John tells us that the Roman cohort is involved. Uh, bringing in some outside sources, it seems that a cohort may include up to around 600 soldiers. And that doesn't mean that all 600 were there. I know today when we talk about uh, the National Guard being called out, that doesn't mean every single member of the National Guard, but it's just a reference to where those soldiers are coming from, but I'm just saying that a cohort may involve up to around 600 soldiers. Uh, John also tells us that they come with lanterns and torches and weapons, and so this is a heavily armed group of people, a great multitude, according to Matthew. In John, Jesus speaks first, uh, John says. Uh, Jesus, therefore, uh, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and so, as I see it, Jesus met them as they were coming. And Jesus says to them, whom do you seek? How can I help you? <laughs> kind of thing. And they answer him, Jesus the Nazarene. And he says to them, I am he. And so he doesn't let, his, let one of his people take the fall for him. You know, oh, there's Jesus over there pointing to Andrew. Nothing like that goes on. But Jesus steps forward willingly. 
and um, and Judas is there, and he's together with them, and Judas is in on this, obviously, and when uh, he says to them, I am he, they draw back, and so they are somewhat terrified. They fall to the ground. I think that's in one of the accounts also. Uh, he repeats this. There's some back and forth there, and then he says to the mob, uh, if therefore you seek me, let these go their way, and John explains that this would fulfill the prophecy, of those whom you have given to me, I lost not a one. And so that's the idea there. Jesus is basically saying, take me. These other men uh, are not the ones that you want. I I'm the one you're looking for. In the middle of all this chaos is where Judas comes in with the kiss. Uh, some assume he might have come in first and then kind of shrunk back when it was getting hectic. And then he had to come back in just to double check the ID there, make sure that they really had Jesus. And uh, in Matthew, Jesus says to Judas, friend, do what you have come for, which is so sad, isn't it? He was his friend, but friend, do what you've come for. Here in Luke, the disciples ask whether they should strike with the sword. You know, hey, you just told us we needed swords. We've got them. Is this, can we, can we chop now? Can we, can we do this? And so they were looking for the Lord's permission. In the heat of the moment, though, one disciple strikes with a sword and lops off the ear of Malchus, who is the uh, servant of the high priest. Uh, John identifies the ear whacker as Simon Peter. And Jesus tells him to stop, though, for all of those who take up the sword will perish by the sword. There's another very famous saying that's out there in the world today. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Well, that's very biblical. It was Jesus who said that in this context in Matthew. And then he goes on to say, Or do you not think that I cannot appeal to my father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. And that's where we get the song, he could have called 10,000 angels. As I understand it, a legion is apparently 6,000 soldiers. And so I think more accurately, he, he could have called not 10,000 angels, but he could have called 72,000 angels. Isn't that right? Uh, I verified this with a middle school math teacher today. Um, but I suppose he could have called 10,000 angels might sound a little bit better than he could have called 72,000 angels. He could have called 10,000. He could have called a lot more than that. And of course here, um, this, this is where that comes from. At this point, Jesus heals Malchus. He puts his ear back on, which is interesting because later in the day, Jesus will tell Pilate that uh, if I were an earthly king, my disciples would be fighting. We'll get to that hopefully next week. Um, and of course, they were fighting for at least <laughs> a split second there. But it's interesting to me that nobody objects to that statement later. Why not? Because then Pilate would have to ask for proof. Well, show me the guy he chopped the ear off of. And of course, at that point, things would get complicated in a hurry. Um, and so that's a part of it. Jesus heals him immediately. There's also a chance that Jesus heals him right away so Peter doesn't get arrested. You know, if Jesus fixes this, it's as if Peter did nothing wrong. Again, there's no proof of it. And remember that promise there, of those you gave me, I lost not a one. If he had not healed this guy's ear, Peter would have certainly been hauled off alongside the Lord and perhaps would have been put to death with him. But uh, to arrest Peter, they know that the slave with the missing ear would be called up as a witness, which would be somewhat problematic if you looked at his ear and it was perfectly intact. So Jesus heals it right away. Uh, back to Luke, as Jesus is arrested and bound, he criticizes the chief priests and the officers of the temple, calling them out for arresting him like a robber. You come to me like, like a criminal? They could have arrested him anywhere, at any time, in the temple, in broad daylight. But they chose to do this under the cover of darkness. And of course, there's a reason for that. Uh, at this point, Matthew and Mark tell us that all of the disciples make a run for it. They all scatter. They run in keeping with the Lord's prophecy that was made just a short time before this. Uh, by the way, Mark throws in some information about a streaker. And a lot of people assume Mark is perhaps telling on himself here. Uh, Mark says, And a certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen sheet over his naked body. And they seized him, but he left the linen sheet behind and escaped naked. And so one of these men running away was completely naked. That's very interesting. Uh, it seems that perhaps Mark wrote himself into his own gospel account here. That's at least the speculation. Of course, the question is, 
uh, why was this young man out there at night with this crowd wearing only a sheet? Well, remember, this happens in the middle of the night, doesn't it? And so it's possible that when word gets out that Jesus is getting arrested, that this is all going down right now, that some of the Lord's followers just jump out of bed immediately and run over to the Garden of Gethsemane. And this is perhaps Mark's way of saying, I was there. Um, I, I was actually a witness of this. So he wasn't there for the Last Supper. He was not one of the twelve. Um, but he did apparently jump right out of bed when he heard this was happening just in time to see Jesus arrested. And so he puts what is per perhaps himself uh, in his account there. But uh, the point for us is uh, everybody runs at this point. Nobody stands up for the Lord and says, I will go with him wherever he goes. That does not happen here. Uh, in the Harmony of the Gospels, we have John 18. 13 through 24 inserted here as we find that Jesus first stop after being arrested is at the house of Annas the father-in-law of Caiaphas the high priest that year uh, this is where we find Peter is following along at a distance at a safe distance he doesn't want to be identified with the Lord but he's kind of concerned about what's going on it seems like and so he follows along from a distance and while Jesus is questioned by the high priest, Peter is out in the courtyard, kind of in the front yard of the house, uh, along with the slaves and the various officials who really weren't in on the, the leadership going on in the trial there. And they're warming themselves around a charcoal fire. Sometimes we don't really think about this, but what was the weather like at the time of the crucifixion? Well, at least the night before, it was cold. It was cold enough to start a fire. And so they're gathered around that charcoal fire. There's a servant girl. Uh, the doorkeeper asks Peter whether he isn't one of the Lord's disciples, and Peter says, I am not. And that is his first of the three denials. Uh, meanwhile, inside, Annas questions Jesus about his disciples, about his teaching. He's kind of, kind of a preliminary, in the middle of the night hearing here, and Jesus basically responds, I've been teaching publicly. Go ask anybody. I, I've been saying all of these things openly and publicly. If you want to know what I've been teaching, ask around. In other words, it's no secret. And at this point, one of the officers strikes Jesus and says, is that the way you answer the high priest? Which is interesting since Jesus is really the only true high priest in this situation. But Jesus answers and says, if I have spoken wrongly, bear witness of the wrong. But if rightly, why do you strike me? Which is interesting. Jesus kind of defends himself at least a little bit verbally here. Annas doesn't have an answer to that, and so he sends Jesus to Caiaphas, the, the real high priest. By the way, Caiaphas is the one who holds the position according to the Roman government, but Annas, the father-in-law, who where we're at in John 18, is the former high priest who was kind of dismissed by the Romans. And it seems that his son-in-law was put in as a little bit of a puppet in his place. But most of the people still look to Annas as the legitimate high priest. I believe in the Old Testament, the high priest was to serve for life. And so Annas wasn't dead yet. So he's still got really the, the real authority. But it's Caiaphas, his son-in-law, who is the official high priest, according to um, being installed by the Roman government. So the Romans were, were messing with the uh, inner workings of the Jewish faith a little bit there. Uh, anyway, um, Annas is still addressed as high priest. I, I think we might describe him today as like high priest emeritus, as we would a former college president or something like that. Or maybe we might compare it to a former president being addressed as president, even though he's not still president. Or maybe a former judge still being addressed as your honor. Uh, but it's interesting that Jesus is first brought to this older and perhaps wiser former high priest. So let's get input on this difficult situation on this case here first. That's where they start. As you might be able to see on the screen there, I've, I've labeled this as Jewish Trial Phase 1 Annas. So uh, at, at the end of this, in John 18, 24, Annas has Jesus bound, tied up, handcuffed, as we would say today, and then sent along to his son-in-law Caiaphas, the high priest. Uh, so we now pick up with Luke 22:54. As Jesus is moved along here, so Luke 22, and we're going to look at verses 54 through 65. Luke 22, 54 through 65. Having arrested him, they led him away and brought him to the house of the high priest. But Peter was following at a distance. 
After they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter was sitting among them. And a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the firelight and looking intently at him, said, This man was with him too. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. A little later, another saw him and said, You are one of them too. But Peter said, Man, I am not. After about an hour had passed, another man began to insist, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he is a Galilean too. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. Immediately while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him, Before a rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him and beating him. And they blindfolded him and were asking him, saying, Prophesy, who is the one who hit you? And they were saying many other things against him, blaspheming. So here we move along to the house of Caiaphas. We have Peter uh, hanging out in the courtyard again. We'll get back to that in just a moment because over in Matthew and Mark, we have the chief priests and the council trying to rustle up some testimony against Jesus uh, for the purpose of putting him to death. That's where they're heading with this. But they're having a hard time getting the witnesses to agree on anything. So there's some discrepancies. People aren't getting their stories straight. They're not lying in the same way, we might say. And, and one of the leading accusations was that Jesus had predicted that he would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. I mean, even with this, though, they, they really couldn't get people to agree concerning what Jesus actually said. And so they, they question him here, but he doesn't answer. Uh, then they ask him whether he's the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus finally says over in Matthew, you have said it yourself. And Mark, he says, I am. And then he quotes from Psalm 110.1 and from Daniel 7.13. He says, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Well, that completely puts these men over the edge. The high priest tearing his robes says, what further need do we have of witnesses? This is blasphemy, according to them. Uh, Jesus now has to die. It's just a matter of figuring out how to do it at this point. They blindfold Jesus and they beat him with their fists. They taunt him, daring him to uh, tell him who it is who is uh, uh, hitting him. Uh, in these multiple beatings and the mocking along the way, those involved almost seem to feed on each other. Um, I, in my own mind, I, I kind of say it's like a, like a locker room situation. They're, they're getting fired up. I don't want to disparage those in locker rooms, but just the, uh, the, the team mentality, they're, they're getting fired up about what's going on here. Um, and it's often kind of like what happens with, with a bully. Unless it's stopped by somebody, it almost seems to feed on itself and, and get worse and worse. Uh, it's like what often happens. Uh, unless it's stopped, it keeps going. One commentary suggested the same thing happens today. In offices, boardrooms, school playgrounds, and restaurant kitchens, it's very easy to jump in with others in tormenting another human being. And maybe that's one small part of what's going on here. And uh, what restraint on the Lord's part. At any moment, while blindfolded, he could have started calling out names, couldn't he have? He could have done that. He could have started sharing private details that these men were thinking, uh, you know, these men who were hitting, hitting him. And, and that might have put an end to it. He could have gotten out of this, is what I'm saying. And yet he restrained himself, just as he also did by not calling down those 72,000 angels. Uh, meanwhile, outside in the courtyard, Peter is warming himself around the fire. And this time we have all three denials. And so it seems that uh, some of the other accounts kind of get merged in here. It seems to overlap a little bit with John's account. And, uh, and right at the moment of the third denial, while he is still speaking, Luke says, is when that rooster crows. So I do not know the man. And right as he says that, that rooster crows. And, um, and Jesus turns and looks at Peter and they make eye contact. If you remember, Jesus is on the inside getting grilled by these officials. Peter's outside in the courtyard, but there's at least this brief moment right as the rooster crows that Jesus and Peter are able to make eye contact. And, and at that moment, uh, Peter remembers that the Lord was absolutely right, that Jesus had predicted this just a couple hours earlier. And at this point, Peter is just overwhelmed and he leaves and he weeps bitterly out there on his own somewhere. 
and uh, just just totally torn up over this. He has denied the Lord not once, not twice, but three times. Uh, by the way, I've missed this my whole life until today. But did you notice in this passage that Jesus is confirmed to be a prophet almost at the exact moment that he's being physically beaten and mocked for not being a prophet? They blindfold Jesus, hitting him in the face, challenging him to tell them who it is who's hitting him right after Peter understands once again that Jesus truly is a prophet. And so Peter is convinced right at almost the same moment these men are not and are, are making fun of him for not being one. That, that's amazing to me. At this point, we're now in the wee hours of the morning, but as I understand it, the Sanhedrin had a rule that for a trial to be legal, it had to be held in the daylight hours. And so out there on their own in the dark, they decide Jesus has got to die. We just got to figure out how oh, we better wait till the sun comes up to make this official and put the stamp on it. And so they reconvene at uh, something, of, uh, as something of a formality in the next paragraph. And that's why we're about to see some repetition here. There's some things that are repeated from one passage to another. They've kind of already had this trial. Now they're having another uh, show trial in order to check the boxes and get that right. So let's move on to Luke 22. Verses 66 through 71. Luke 22, 66 through 71. When it was day, the council of elders of the people assembled, <clears throat> both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council chamber, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask a question, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. And they all said, are you the son of God then? And he said to them, yes, I am. And then they said, what further need do we have of testimony? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. So again, this third phrase is something of a quick formality. Uh, all in favor of killing Jesus, say I kind of meeting. Uh, Mark refers to it as a consultation. Luke makes sure we know that this happens when it is day. So again, this is sunrise now. We can get the dirty work done in the daytime. Of course, it's like six in the morning. Nobody's there. It's, it's just them. Uh, Matthew tells us that this happens when morning has come. Mark says that this happens early in the morning. So this takes place around sunrise on Friday morning, if I understand it correctly. Uh, here in Luke, the chief priests, the scribes, they're wanting Jesus to admit that he is the Christ, the Messiah. Well, what, what would it matter? He could have said yes or no, and it, it wouldn't have mattered at this point. But here Jesus deflects and suggests that if he answers, they wouldn't believe it. And uh, that right there is an answer, isn't it? He, he answers their question in a sense, um, and they wouldn't believe it. And, and that's, he's basically saying yes without saying yes. Uh, but he continues obviously talking about himself, suggesting again that he will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So not standing before God like a criminal before a judge, he would be seated at God's right hand. So he's saying he's up there on the same level as God. He is God. And uh, when they ask him straight up whether he is the Son of God, he says, yes. But notice he doesn't just say yes. He says, yes, I am. And I would point out, not only is the yes a problem with these men, uh, but the I am is probably even more of a problem than the yes is. Uh, that goes back to God meeting Moses at the burning bush. Moses wants to know what to say to Pharaoh. Who do I say sent me? And God basically says, tell them the I am sent you to, to them. And, um, and so God is the I am. And Jesus takes this title on himself here. And this is not by accident. And this is another reminder to me that Jesus probably could have talked his way out of this if he had wanted to do it, but he did not. Instead, uh, Jesus uh, seems to be intentionally triggering these people. He is setting them off on purpose, leading to his own death. Uh, further evidence that he is giving up his life here uh, voluntarily. Okay, at this point in the harmony, we uh, have a bit of an update on Judas that we don't have in Luke, but we have it in Matthew and Acts. This comes from Matthew 27, 3 through 10, as well as something of a parallel over in Acts 1. Basically, Judas sees what's happening here, and he regrets his role in it. And so he tries to return the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and the elders. He wants, he's giving a refund of this blood money. And he comes into the temple, he confesses, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they say to him, what is that to us? See that that's yourself. In other words, 
that's not our problem. You know, I, that's that's your deal. See to that yourself. It's too bad. It's, it's not on us anymore. And Judas then throws the silver into the sanctuary of the temple and goes out and he hangs himself. Uh, ultimately, the chief priests take the coins. I did just picturing these men in robes on their hands and knees crawling around the holy place in the temple picking up coins it's just a it's a disgusting it's a disgusting picture um, but Judas goes out he, he takes his own life and ultimately when they collect the coins they decide it's not lawful to put blood money in the treasury isn't that bizarre and so they use the funds to purchase a plot of land that'll be used to bury the poor and strangers uh, Matthew explains all this happens to fulfill the prophecy from Jeremiah and Zechariah. Um, what amazes me here is that these people have used coerced testimony to murder the Son of God. And what are they worried about? They've paid money, we assume perhaps from the treasury to make this happen, but they're concerned that this money can't be put back into the treasury without violating God's law. You know how many other of God's laws they violated? in this night but here they are worried about this money being dirty for some reason and i don't know about you i'm, I'm thinking about something jesus said about straining gnats and swallowing camels these men are about to crucify the son of god but they won't accept a rather small donation on a technicality it's just absolutely strange but uh, this brings us to what comes next as jesus is now moved um from trial by Jew with these three parts. You know, you got Annas, Caiaphas, and the Sanhedrin, and now he's about to be transferred over uh, to the Roman phase of this trial before Pilate. And that brings us to where we want to pick up next Wednesday, if the Lord wills, at Luke 23, verse 1. We're going to shift from the Jewish phase to the Roman phase through the legal proceedings. So thank you for being with us tonight, either online or on the phone. Uh, be sure to send me any prayer concerns, anything that we need to be praying about, any way that we can help, any updates for the bulletin, I'd appreciate. And be sure to sign up for worship this coming Lord's Day. As you log off tonight, that'd be a good time to do it. Just put your name down for 9 o'clock this coming Sunday morning, and we'll again have the one service at 9, and then replay that service on the projector at 1030 if we need to. Um, the online and the phone options continue to remain the same. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, tonight we stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love all of us, sinners, condemned, and unclean. As we sometimes sing, we are in awe of his marvelous and wonderful love, knowing that it was for all of us he prayed in the garden, not his, but your will be done. He truly had no tears for his own grief, but sweat drops of blood for all of us. As angels came from the world of light to comfort him and his sorrows, we know that he carried those sorrows for us that night. He took our sins and our sorrows and made them his very own. He then took that burden of our sin to the cross where he suffered and died alone. Thank you, Father, for loving us in that way. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.